global surprises in 30 minutes. Why there should be more exclamation marks in this unique book. Writer, church pastor and Bible teacher Mike Beaumont explains all to David Tavener. The title of this conversation is The Strange Staff. What kind of staff are we talking about? (laughs) Well, we're not talking about the people who you work with at your office. That's one thing for sure. We're talking about a staff in the sense of the the shepherd's staff, the the shepherd's crook, as it might have been. Uh, Staffs are sometimes used even in like martial arts today as, as, as weapons or for protecting. But the staff that we're looking at here is almost certainly, imagine a shepherd's staff may not have had that little crook on the end that we're familiar with. A long wooden stick. A long wooden stick that would have been cut from a fairly straight branch, just trimmed, and was used by shepherds in their work for just tapping the sheep along, helping guide them on their way. And who did this particular one belong to? Well, the one we're looking at Today, belong to a guy called Moses, who holds a pretty big part of the Old Testament story. So it's Moses who has this staff, this strange staff. Why is it strange? It's strange because of how it is used. I think the important thing we underline at the beginning before we say anything about what happens to it is there's no sense of it being a magic staff. The staff will epitomise and symbolise the power of God, not the power of the staff. And it will be used in a whole number of ways. So the first is having been called by God, and perhaps, again, it's just important, a little bit of backstory, to say that Moses was born as an Israelite while God's people were there in slavery In Egypt, they'd been there for, oh, 430 years. You know, you turn the page from Genesis to Exodus, only takes a moment, but 430 years have passed. But God's people have kept up their traditions. Moses was born as an Israelite, but ended up growing up in Pharaoh's household when Pharaoh had got so worried about the growing number of immigrants, he'd ordered that the firstborn babies be thrown into the River Nile. And he'd been preserved by his mother, hidden away in a little basket in the reeds, found by Pharaoh's daughter, brought up by Pharaoh in Pharaoh's house. So he'd grown up an Egyptian. But when he was 40 years old, he'd ended up killing an Egyptian, actually out of a good heart to protect someone who was being mistreated, who was an Israelite. Then fleeing to Midian, where he spent the next 40 years. So he's 80 years old now. And there in Midian, in chapter 3, we find him having an encounter with the living God. Now, a God he would have been told about, but a God whom he has not yet met for himself. Perhaps a bit like today, people might have been told the stories of Jesus and God when they were a child. Maybe some went to Sunday school. Maybe some heard it in their state school or from parents or grandparents. But it's not really clicked. Well, for Moses, he'd heard the stories, but it really clicks in chapter three when he has this encounter with the living God at the burning bush. And God reveals himself to him, but not only reveals himself, says now, I've got a job for you. I am going to send you to Pharaoh to say to him, let my people go. And of course, uh, Moses is, you know, full of stories. Who am I that I should go? I'm not a very good speaker. Uh, What can I do? What am I going to do if they don't believe me? And it's at this point that this strange stuff brings its first surprise to us In, in chapter four. When Moses says to God, what if they don't believe me or listen to me and say the Lord didn't appear to you? And the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? Now, of course, what he got in his hand as a shepherd, which is what he'd become by then, was his shepherd's stuff. What he would have used day by day. Interesting, isn't it, that it's something that he would have used day by day the very ordinary of life that God could take and use for his purposes. And he says, a staff, and God said, throw it on the ground. And Moses threw it on the ground 
and it became a snake and he ran from it. And the Lord said to him, reach out your hand, take it by the tail. And Moses reached out, took hold of the snake and turned it back into a staff in his hand. Now, actually, that would take a lot of courage and I would have really needed to have heard God personally to have picked up the snake again. But God says this is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob has appeared to you. So that's the very first appearance of this strange stuff. Must have been a huge surprise to Moses. Why does God do this? Is this normal? No. This is not the normal sort of thing that happens in the Bible. This is God about to do something incredibly significant, not just for his people, but for the history of the whole salvation of the world, ultimately. And therefore, we get this very strange thing happening. Moses really needed to know that this was God. This was the God of his fathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, who was speaking. This was really God speaking. Remember, he is about to go and confront the most powerful man on earth at the time and say, excuse me, Mr. Pharaoh, but my God says to you and your many gods of Egypt that you're to let your unpaid slave force go. And Moses really, really needed to know that God was with him. So God does this incredibly strange, unique thing. And that's the beginning of the story of the strange stuff. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot more surprises. In fact, you've mentioned one already, which was the burning bush. Yeah, I mean, seeing a burning bush in the hot desert. Remember, temperatures out there regularly reach 45 degrees centigrade. So to see a bush spontaneously combusting was no great surprise. But what was strange, what the surprise was about this bush was not that it burnt, but rather that it burnt and burnt and burnt and burnt and just never stopped burning to the point where in chapter 3 we read that Moses saw that though the bush was on fire it didn't burn up and said I'll go over and see this strange sight why the bush does not burn up so there was his first surprise why doesn't it burn second surprise of that day was he suddenly finds God's there now it's not that God's contained in anything, but God chooses to appear in this burning bush. God often appears through the symbol of fire in the Bible. And there, as he approaches this bush, God calls to him. First, he calls him by name. Wow, that must have been a surprise. How does this God who I have never known and never heard of know me by name? Hey, listen, any listeners who are doubting this, whether you know God or not yet, God knows you. God knows you by name. He knows all about you. And like he does with Moses, he wants to reach out to you. And Moses says something simple. Here I am. God tells him to take his sandals off because he's on holy ground. And, and then God reveals himself to him and says, I've, I've seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cry. I've come down to help them and to bring them out of slavery into the land that I promised Abraham all that time ago. Moses says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And then God speaks, he says, because I am with you and reveals his name. I am who I am. In other words, he's the God who always is. There never is a time when he isn't. He was ising for Abraham and ising for Isaac and ising for Jacob. And I'm ising now for you, Moses. And David, he's still ising for you and I today because he always is. He is the I am who is always there and always at work. And this must have been a huge surprise for him to not just have seen a bush that didn't burn up, but to have encountered the living God through it, the God he'd heard about in the past is now the God who's making himself known to him and who wants not just to reveal himself to him, but to actually use him for this very significant purpose. So I think it would be underestimated to say that 
Moses isn't going to be influenced by these things. That burning bush that doesn't stop burning, the staff in his hand that turns into a snake. So his relationship with God then, I mean, is that getting better? The relationship with God grows, there's no doubt. And some of it grows through these chapters three and four, where he has this backwards and forwards with God, this sort of a long list of, okay, God, here's number reason 26 why I I can't do this. And eventually God says to him, oh, for goodness sake, all right, so you think you can't speak. What about your brother Aaron, the lever? He can be a mouthpiece. He can go with you. And God sends him on his way. So there's a growing relationship here. And I, I think the thing about these chapters is this is not just a picture of God appears to Moses and Moses saying, oh, yes, my goodness, the creator of the whole universe has just sent me to go and do this difficult job. I will go. Now, he's struggling here. He's, yeah, but Lord, but what about, and I can't speak, and, you know, what if they don't believe me? And he's he's having to negotiate with God a bit here as he's feeling his way into this relationship. But as these chapters unfold, we will see a growing sense of confidence in Moses that the living God, the creator of all things, is indeed truly with him and has sent him. God must have been getting a bit frustrated with Moses, though. I think he was. I mean, there's a verse at one point where it says the Lord's anger burnt against Moses, though the anger is followed up by a graciousness of that, well, take Aaron with you. And I suppose it came because, you know, how many signs and how many reassurances do you need, you know, before you would believe that God spoke? And I suppose that's a challenge to us today, you know, when people say, well, if I could just have one more sign. Yeah, but if you got that one more sign, how many more signs would you need after that? And the point comes where we have to step out in faith on what we have already heard and seen and trust that God is spoken. And it's at at that point when, you know, there's a mixture of God getting angry with him that he says to him, what about Aaron? In fact, Aaron's already on the way to meet you. He can do some of the speaking for you. And then God says, but take this staff in your hand so that you can perform miraculous signs with it. The interesting thing is in the Hebrew that word this is emphatic, but take this stuff, this one here, this one that you're holding, that you've just seen has turned into a serpent, and this one that you've been using throughout your ordinary life, you, you don't need to keep waiting for yet more signs. Take this stuff, come on now, Moses, take this stuff and go, and you're going to perform miraculous signs with it. So it does all go smoothly as Moses is supposed to be heading back to Pharaoh? Well, the funny thing is, it looks like anything but, because there is this big surprise comes into the story towards the end of chapter four. He goes to see his father-in-law because he's found a wife while he's been in Midian and says, let me go back to Egypt to see if my folk are okay. And Jethro says, yeah, go, off you go. So he sets off to go to Egypt to do this massive task that God has given to him. And and I wonder what was going through his mind, you know, if it were me, I'd be rehearsing. So I will say this and Pharaoh will say that, and then I'll probably say this, but if he doesn't, so, you know, maybe he's going through that sort of thing. And God speaks to him and says, when you return, See that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I've given you the power to do. So it's like he's hearing these mental conversations. But then this really strange thing happens as God reassures him and says, yeah, go on, go back, tell him to let your firstborn son go, my firstborn son go. And then we read this strange word. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah, I bet that was a surprise. But Zipporah, his wife, took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. Now, what on earth is going on there? Why would God now want to 
kill Moses. After all that? After all of that. I mean, he's just gone through this lengthy rigmarole of encouraging him to go. And now here's this surprise of God trying to, quotes, kill him. Why? Well, it seems to be it's all to do with the fact that his son was not circumcised. Now, remember, circumcision was the covenant sign God had given to Abraham. He'd said very clearly that all the descendants of Abraham were to be circumcised, baby boys on the eighth day, as an outward marker of the inward relationship that they had with God. And it looks like Moses had neglected that. And I think what's going on here is God saying, yes, it is me sending you to do this, but I want you to know, Moses, you can you can only serve me on my terms, not on yours. And if you are going to do this crucial covenant work for me, then the covenant has to be in place in your life. And you have not done something that is most fundamental. You have not circumcised your son. You have not, as you were, nailed your colours to the mast and declared, I am truly one of God's covenant people. And it's interesting that his wife, Zipporah, instantly knows what's going on. It's funny, isn't it? Married guys out there, how many times can our wives see as plain as the nose on our face what's going on when we can't? She instantly sees what's going on, takes a flint knife, circumcises their baby boy and touches Abraham's feet with the foreskin. Why? As a way of saying, I have done this on behalf of you, his father. So a big challenge here, a big surprise on the way. But God's way of saying, Moses, we are going to do this together, but you really do have to do it my way, not yours, on my terms, not yours. Let's get that right straight up front so that we're on a good foundation. So not an empty threat from God, a resetting for Moses, really, of what it was all about. I think that's a really good way to sum it up, David, a a resetting of that relationship that was going to be so fundamental to everything that would happen there. So I imagine Moses does then respond to the challenge and goes and presents himself to Pharaoh. Yeah, I think he would, wouldn't you, if you, you know, (laughs) God has just tried to kill me. I think on balance, I will now go and do exactly what he told me to do is is probably a wise step. So he does in chapter five, he, he does go to Pharaoh and passes on God's message. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival in the desert to me. And another surprise comes for Moses when Pharaoh says no. Now, again, put yourself in context. You have just had this powerful encounter with God at the burning bush. Your life has been turned around. You have seen the staff turn into a serpent. God himself has just tried to kill you because you wouldn't do this the right way. And it's like all your ducks are lined up in a row here for going and saying, the Lord says to you, Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh's going to fall on his feet and say, oh, yes, I repent. And everyone's going to go. And instead he says, who is the Lord that I should obey him? Now, remember, Egyptians had dozens and dozens, hundreds of different gods. Who is the Lord? Who is Yahweh, to use what was probably his Hebrew name? I don't know him and won't let him go. So there is this, what I'm sure was a a big surprise to Moses when he has been convinced God has spoken, but the very opposite happens. I wonder how often that might happen for us. You know, we believe God's spoken to us through scripture or through a, a word, a prophetic word of some kind. We've stepped out to do it. And then the very opposite happens. What do we do at that point? Do we back off? Oh, I think I must have got it wrong. Or do we go away and do we press into God. And that's clearly what happens here. Initially, Pharaoh simply makes it worse. He makes the work even harder for his slave by saying, I'm not going to give you the straw to make the bricks. You go and collect your own in future. So, of course, the people then react 
against Moses because they think, well, all you've done is now make it worse. And, and Moses has to go back to God and say, Lord, what, why have you brought this trouble on you? Is this why you sent me at the end of chapter five? And then in chapter six, God says to Moses, now you'll see what I'll do to Pharaoh because of my mighty hand. He will let them go. Goes back and tells the Israelites what God said, but they are still as discouraged as ever. And it's at that point again that the strange staff is going to be used to bring surprises both to Moses and to Pharaoh. I was going to say, he's still got this, as we're calling it, strange staff in his hand. Yeah, and it's with that that in chapter 7, he goes to see Pharaoh. Uh, there's a little time note. It says he was now 80 years old at this point. So he's not a young guy going to speak to this young, powerful Pharaoh. And he goes into Pharaoh's presence. And God has said, uh, when you go and see him this time, perform a miracle. Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh and it will become a snake. He'd already seen that. He'd already seen that, except it might be slightly different because the Hebrew word for snake here is different to the word that was snake in the previous one. The actual word here is more monster. And so that might be the word that they were using for crocodile, which, of course, would be very relevant in Egypt where there were lots of crocodiles and where the crocodile god was one of their gods. So the staff was going to be turned into a crocodile snake or a crocodile so he goes to pharaoh uh, throws his staff down in front and there it becomes the snake or the crocodile but then another surprise of an unexpected kind pharaoh summoned the wise men and sorcerers and the egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts you think my goodness what's happening here so they all throw their stuff's down and, and they become a, a snake or a crocodile. What's going on here, God? And then Aaron's stuff swallowed up their stuffs. And you think, isn't this just sort of primitive magic going on here? Well, I think what's going on again, this is not the normal stuff that happens in the Bible. This is an exceptional event for an exceptional time. And I think this is all part of God doing what the book of Exodus calls hardening Pharaoh's heart. Yeah, okay, your God can do miracles. My gods can do just as many miracles. And his sheer indifference towards God and the suffering of his people. And you know, actually that section ends with the words, yet Pharaoh's heart became hard and he would not listen to them. And so God sends a whole number of plagues there will be nine followed by the final tenth plague which will be the death of the firstborn but moses's staff plays a significant role in each of them each time he's told to stretch forth uh, his staff for when the nile turns to blood for when frogs appear for when a plague of gnats comes and then when the hail falls and then when the plague of locusts come for five of the next nine or ten plagues, the staff will play a significant role. Again, it's not magic, it's symbolic. It's, it's a way of letting Pharaoh know this is not just one of those things. It's not just that, oh, a plague of locusts has come again. We do get those from time to time. Each of these plagues happens only as Moses stretches out his hand holding that stuff. It's a declaration that this is God at work. And each time God's, as it were, turning the screw slightly on Pharaoh, wanting him to, come on, come on, you know what I want. All I want is for you to free my people from slavery. But each time he just hardens his heart against God. And I guess all the time he's also testing Moses' obedience. Yeah, absolutely, because... You know, it would have been easy, wouldn't it, to think, come on, God, how many more of these? Just done this miracle. This is not working, is it? Well, give it another go. Oh, OK, I'll do one more. 
But I wonder if we would still have been there by number nine and number 10, or if we would have thought, this really is a waste of time. This is not working. Or I think I must have misheard. But rather he stuck at it and stuck at it and stuck at it until there was the final breakthrough with the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn in Israel, but the protection of all the Israelite baby boys as blood was daubed over their doorpost and the festival of Passover was celebrated for the first time and Pharaoh at last says, get out of here. What part did this staff have throughout Moses' life? As well as the incidents that we've seen so far, one of the most significant ones will come in the most significant event of the Old Testament. That is, having celebrated the Passover festival that God had instituted, that daubing of the blood over the door to protect the Israelites. In chapter 14, as Moses is told to get out with all the Israelites from the land of Egypt, they flee Pharaoh suddenly realises what he's done, chases after them with his horses and chariots, and Moses suddenly finds himself blocked by the Red Sea in front of them and the Egyptians behind them. And what on earth is he going to do? And in chapter 14, Moses answers the people as they get panicky and start to say what they will say, not for the last time, why did you bring us out? Didn't we tell you we would have been better to stay in Egypt? It's funny how people can rewrite history, isn't it? And Moses says, don't be afraid, stand firm and you'll see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And then God says to Moses, tell the Israelites to move on, raise your staff, and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on the dry ground. That's exactly what happens. As he raises his staff and stretches it out, God sends a strong east wind that blows the waters back. The Israelites on foot are able to pass through the dried up mud. The Egyptians try to chase after them, but in their heavy chariots sink into the mud and as the wind drops and the waters come back, they are drowned and the Israelites are free to begin their journey to the promised land. So it plays a hugely significant role there in the crossing of the Red Sea. In the journey itself, it will be significant. In, in chapter uh, 17, God tells him to use it to bring water from the rock when uh, there is no water supply for them in the desert. And he says, strike the rock there with his staff. And, and Moses strikes the, the rock with his staff and, and water is brought forth. In Later on in chapter 17, the staff is raised to bring victory over the Amalekites when they attack them. And so this staff will play a, a significant role again and again in this journey out of Egypt and to the promised land. So in conclusion, is there perhaps a lesson here that God used the staff rather than just Moses because he almost needed to remind Moses that it wasn't all about him? You know, whenever God uses us with the best will in the world, it is easy to think, I did well there, didn't I? Whether we've, you know, done something good at work or preached a good message or shared a good testimony or a good prophetic word or prayed a good prayer. And as a little bit in all of us sort of smiles inwardly and thinks, good job there, David. Good job there, Mike. And I think the fact that each time Moses had to use the staff for these things was a reminder, not that the staff was magic, we've said that many times, but that this strange staff was a reminder to him. It wasn't Moses who'd done this. It wasn't Moses's clever words. It wasn't Moses's winsome ways. It, it, it wasn't Moses's skill at leading the people because they were always grumbling and remembering. It was what this staff pointed to and the God who had given it to him. Yahweh, the God who always is. 
And so the strange staff that did strange things was indeed a a permanent reminder to Moses. This wasn't his doing. It was the doing of the God who had revealed himself to him, called him to serve him, and sent him out to act on his behalf. And God is still doing the same with his people today. Let's just make sure we don't put ourselves in the first place. And rather we remember it's the staff of God that does these things. You've been listening to Mike Beaumont in conversation with David Tavner. Bible Surprises in 30 Minutes is a United Christian Broadcasters production. For more about UCB, go to ucb.co.uk.